than that I was. Were you? No. Yeah. The World Series, they want their bat ball. Yeah. Was he one of the planes? And, you know, it was funny. In 1960, Pittsburgh played. In 1961, we won the World Series. We took a train. Our man said it was flying on the plane on the way home in 60. Oh, from Pittsburgh. Yeah, it was. It was right next to him. We were all Brian, but they all talk about the Mick. That was not a... No, was, was Ralph on that team uh, in 60? He was the first base coach. He was a catcher. Uh, he backed up Yogi, didn't he? The third string. He and Howard, and he was. But he never got in a game. Yeah. In fact, he wasn't there with Howard. He was there. Forty-seven. Oh, who did you just meet? Who? Frankie. Who is he? Forty-seven. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Who is he? Unfortunately. He's back, right, right, right. You're not going to get much playing. But that's what he learned. I guess he learned by sitting in the bullpen. It's like you know, Dick Williams, guys like that. You know, sport great catchers players. become good managers. Catchers think a little bit more about yeah. baseball. They yeah. handle pitches. They get into Four. game situations yeah. a, a lot more than uh, right. yeah. field player, the quarterback. And he's, I, I coach and I tell the catchers, you see everything. The only guy you're facing the other way. You see the one that's setting up the deal. You're messing with the camera, you're in trouble. What? We're here at Ralph Houck tonight in Newington. Uh, manager of the 61 Yankees, Patrick Smith Sean. He's buddy. All the scouts were there. They must have had about. everybody what a great club this is over 200 people here tonight to talk baseball and what's better than that I'm here tonight uh, I was the bad boy of that great 1961 New York Yankee team you didn't do that good a job <laughs> Team that was. We had an outfield of Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle, and Roger Maris. Two guys in the Hall of Fame, and the third one, Roger, sure belongs there. I don't think there was a better right fielder in the game. Strong arm. No one took an extra base on Roger. No one. 60 at first base. I was the bat boy, and then players were, uh, didn't have to wear their helmet to run the bases. They would only have to wear the helmet to bat. So the players would get to first base and flip the helmet to Mr. Houck, and I would run up the line to get the helmet, and he had a way of throwing that helmet. He would lead me. I used to just lead me with that helmet, and I would run and never lose a stride. Today, every game I go to, I watch these first base coaches and the bat boys hand them things. They all have to run up to the coach. Nobody could do it like this guy. He had the way. We had it down real good. Today. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And in 1961, when the Yankees announced that Mr. Huff was going to be the manager, the first thing he did was ask Yankee Mantle if he would be our captain. And we all know what kind of player Mickey Mantle was. And Mickey refused. He says, Thank you. You know, what an honor to be an ass to be the captain of the Yankees. But of course, Lou Gehrig was the only captain the Yankees ever had. And Mick refused, and Ralph let him know that, Mick, if you know it or not, you are our leader. And that he was. Uh, he was no stranger to the Yankees. Uh, when he was the manager, before he became our first base coach, he was the manager at Denver which was the Yankee Triple-A team. And a lot of our players on that 61 team were at Denver. 
almost the whole infield, Richardson, Kubek, Boyd, Johnny Blanchett, uh, a lot of the young pitchers on the pitching staff. So he was no stranger. I remember early in the season, we lost a tough game to the Detroit Tigers. And after the game, I was in the clubhouse and I was talking with Pete Sheehy, who then was the Yankee clubhouse manager, who had been there for over 50 years. He was there with Babe Ruth, Luke Garrick, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Tom Mantle, Reggie Jackson. He was there with all of them. And I remember sitting there with Pete, and I said, Pete, this is going to be a tough season. And Pete says, you know, this is the first time in all my years working with the Yankees that I feel confident we're going to win. And I was surprised to hear that from Pete. And I said, Pete, what makes you say that? He says, this team will do anything for Ralph Howard. If he asked them to run through brick walls, they'll do it. The man had a lot of respect. When he used to come into the center of the clubhouse and say, guys, I got something to say. You know that TV commercial, Leah Hutton, how everybody just goes silent? Well, that's the way it was. When he came to the center of that clubhouse, everybody just went silent. Then I remember another time, I saw the other side. Uh, we were playing a game the second game of the doubleheader. We lost the first game of the doubleheader to the Baltimore Orioles. The second game of the doubleheader, we were losing in the bottom of the ninth. There was one out, and Cleek Boyer was the hitter. It was a 1-1 pitch. It was low outside, and I could see it was ball two. And the ump yelled, strike. Well, the whole team went bananas. Strike. Next pitch, he swings and misses, strike three. Next batter pops up, we lose the ball game. And I remember running back to the dugout, I see the manager going after the umpire. I said, is that Ralph Houck? He said, yes. Couldn't believe it, he went ballistic. <laughs> and I didn't know it till the next day I got home. Uh, on Monday I'm reading the newspaper and the American League president suspended him five games. And I remember him sitting in the clubhouse watching the games on TV, saying that you can't call balls and strikes from the TV. It's amazing. The ball right down the middle looks like a perfect strike, ball one. That's the way it was. Uh, I remember another time we were in Detroit. And in that movie, 61, a lot of you have seen that movie, 1961, uh, with the asterisk, uh, about the 61 Yankees. And then uh, there was a moment where one of the fans threw a chair onto right field at Roger Maris. Well, that really happened. And when that happened, the manager, of course, went out there and he tried to set some, uh, <coughs> set some choice words to the fans out there. Him himself went right out there and gave it to the fans. Then I'll hear me, you want to hear Mr. Houghton. Thank you. I think this stage I stand before you and bore you with statistics, tell you what Ralph Houck hit in this year and what league and so forth. I'm not going to do that. You people, to over 200 of you showed up tonight. You know about him. You know he's probably the most respected man in baseball. Silver Star winner in World War II, a man known as the Major. And incidentally, Frank, he, he sort of stole my story. <laughs> but that's okay, the yeah, button thing. Uh, Dan Keating here, our Vice President, goes to all of the Yankee reunions, the 61 Yankees primarily, and he's sort of an unofficial chauffeur driving these people around. And in the car, you, your van, whatever it was, you find uh, Johnny Blanchard, uh, Moose Gowan, and little Bob Turley. Now, all three of these gentlemen have been here recently. Blanchard's rather quiet, but those other two, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, remember Moose told me to sit out at yeah, the meeting. Yeah, why, why are you standing there? Sit out. A big standing ovation for Ralph Howe.
bat boy, I, I, that bat boy, uh, you know, he was a pretty good bat boy, but I believe he talks more than he carried bats. <laughs>
He said, don't take me out skating. He said, I can get him in those. I know I can get him. You know, he convinced me he'd get him. The first pitch, and those are single to center field, and we wind up losing that ball. You, know? <laughs> you remember the losses more than you do the wins. You know? <laughs> and, and Whitey came after me. You under skip. I'm sorry. You know, I'll never forget that. But <laughs> the, the Yankees have been real good to me. And uh, I've enjoyed every minute that I managed there. I, I can tell you the stories that happened. Uh, that maybe I shouldn't tell at times. <laughs> Do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask me, by the way? Yeah. I think with, with all this steroid talk going on, I think that the most upsetting thing, most upsetting thing is there are records that should have not been broken, like Roger 61. Now that they're starting to clean it up, last year was the first year, I think five years, that nobody hit 50 home runs. You look at these guys now, Giambi, lost about 20 pounds, back well the same. Well, I'm not going to get into that because, you know, I, I, the worst thing I did was shoot a back guy. I wouldn't have made anybody to do that anymore. And, but I, I don't know about that story, story. And I don't think anybody really does. As far as uh, records go, I'm never much on records. Uh, to me, whoever the black boy was telling you that uh, about Mer Merrick's, I think, I think he belongs in the Hall of Fame. He's a, he was an outstanding right fielder. And in San Francisco World Series, uh, we'd have lost that series if it wouldn't have been for Roger. He, when he threw, uh, somebody kept him from going to third. Threw the guy on the third. He, he made some great plays in that game. Of course, I was a brilliant manager. You remember that series? <laughs> I do, too. Uh, you know, we, we, we got rained out a lot. We finally got down to the final game. And, and uh, what's his name, the big first baseman? <clears throat> Was up and coming and, and, and yeah and the, 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 we had a base open and uh, runners on they had runners on first and second and first base was open and there was two out now what do you do and Cepeda was the next hitter I had an awful lot of respect for Cepeda and uh, and uh, so I went to the mound. And there's been a lot of different stories. You know, I knew you were going to get, you know, you don't think about it. All you want to do is get somebody out. So I went out there and I talked to Terry. And I said, now you got the controls all right. And I said, McCovey is going to be anxious to, to hit the ball. He's not, you know, they all want to be heroes. So I said, just, you know, throw three balls. And you can't get two, but maybe you'll swing at them. And I don't think, I don't think Ralph remembers me even saying that because I've talked to him about it. And I remember it very, very clearly. Well, the first pitch, I just walked out to the dugout, and he had, had got this line drive you've ever seen, and, and uh, Richardson kind of backed up to catch it. I thought it was a base hit. I really did, but Bobby caught it, and the, the game ended. That was it, you know. Well, now, of course, it's a long ways down to the other, for our dressing room. Now, I finally get down there, and of course, there's all the, well, you know how writers are. They're going to second guess you even if you win the ball game. So they, they were really on me. Why would you ever pitch to McCovey with a right hander coming up in, in Sabata? And I, all I said was, well, How did it come out? You know, what did I guess? I mean, I didn't know what to say. But that's the way it was. So there's a lot of things you remember uh, in baseball. And that was one of them. That probably, you, oh, we could have lost that ball. I remember a game. I wasn't managing then. Let's see, that would have been with Casey, I guess. We were in Detroit, and Yogi, you know, if he could have just been a little better right fielder, I might have got to do a lot of catching when I first came out. <laughs> he started out as a, as a right fielder. And Eddie Robinson was catching against uh, right handers. He was left handed, and I was catching against the, the left handers. But then, of course, Yogi wasn't that great a right fielder. He was not bad, but. He wasn't great. And of course, they had to put him in the lineup. There's no way about it. He could hit. He could, really hit. He could hit the first day in spring training. He didn't have to have any practice or anything. So, anyway, that's the way it was with him. So, I, but I'll never forget the day that we were in Detroit. And in those days in Detroit, the bullpen, I was a coach then, the bullpen was, uh, no, I guess I was still playing. And, Dizzy Trout. Do I remember, anybody here remember Dizzy Trout? Well, he was a great, a good pitcher and kind of a wild guy. 
and we all sat down there together. We almost had fights down there because, you know, we were all right together. And uh, Yogi had evidently got a base hit off of him the last time he pitched, but it was a big series, and they put uh, Trout in the bullpen. And he said that that day goes so-and-so ever comes up again, and he said, he'll go right there. I don't repeat the words he said, but he was going to knock him on the, you know, down. <laughs> you know, we almost got a fight over that out there, I remember. And it was not nice. For the audience. When the season ended, everybody had a place to go hunting up in Michigan. And I was invited to go. There was Stern Weiss one year and then some other people, but Trout was the main guy. A lot of players went up there for a five of us. And it was a hunting camp, sort of. We, uh, everybody, one guy had to stay in camp and cook. The rest of them got to go out and hunt to the deer stands and one thing or another. But the cook would have like a stew, or we'd fix up all kind of different things that you could eat up, big pans of soup. And uh, then they, they had an outhouse. This was really out in the woods. And, and the outhouse was quite a ways from the cabin. So, you know, you'd be out there all day and you'd come in and, and you'd be real hungry. And of course, we had this, this, this stew usually. But when it came to trout time, and by the way, they drank a lot of beer in those days. And you'd have to get up there in the middle of the, you know, the night, a lot of time, and go out to the outhouse. So, but anyway, we finally decided we'd use a, one of them, I don't know what they call it, but, you know, you could go in the cabin. So we had that in there, and you didn't have to walk through the cold, and snow to get out of the outhouse, so the trout went down. Well, he was his day to cook. He his little tent, and he bought one just like that one. And uh, we all came in for hunting, and he had this big stew, and he looked like he fixed it, and he brought it out to the truck. <laughs> Some of your memories of the, you might say, the post-61 era of the team, something like the late 60s, early 70s, and all the Yankees were in the bad times there, but they well, had a couple we, teams then. When we had the bad times, you know, the, 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 uh, the Kennys and the Clarks weren't quite as good as the Quebecs and the Richardsons and the uh, basement, and that really hurt us. And, we, and there's, we, we hadn't planned on that. The Yankees had not planned on that. We had nobody to come up from the farm system to replace players like that. And I remember, you know, when I left the Yankees in 73, I decided I was going to retire. You know, you get tired of people booing you and telling you to go home, so I decided it's about time I better do it. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll give George all the credit, Steinbrenner. And, uh, I didn't really know George that well at that time. He treated me good, I will say that. And they had the meeting, they were, uh, Gabe Paul was there at the time. And uh, they called me in there, I mean, I had notified him that I was gonna leave. I mean, I called Lee McPhail, he went in and told him that I called him and said, when I get home from the road trip, that I was gonna tell him I was leaving. So anyway, I had the meeting when I got back and uh, went up to the office. And there, George was there, Gabe Paul was there, leaving fail. And uh, we had quite a meeting. And one thing George said he was going to do, I was, he was going to get new coach, coaches. And I said, as long as I've managed, I've had my own coaches. And he said, well, it's changed now. I'm going to have the coaches. Well, I said, that's it for me. That could be a good excuse to get out of it. Over and Lee said, you can't do that. Gabe Paul said, I asked how you I'm going home, I've had. And uh, George said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. You're making a mistake. I had a year to go on my contract when I left. I was still, I think, supposed to manage in the 74. And uh, he said, I'm going to go out and get some good ball players. Well, I didn't know George had all that money here. <laughs> wasn't paying me that kind of money. You know? And I, I said, well, I'm, I'm gone. I'm retiring. And he said, well, I'm going out and getting some good ball players. Well, he, he 
went out. And he got Catfish Hunter and he got Reggie. When you add two players like that to a ball club, and you're pretty, you're already a lot better. And that's where I probably made a mistake, or I'd have been there a lot longer. We got home, and then they called me to Detroit, and they talked me to go there. But, uh, but George is a great baseball man, whether you people know it or not. He, uh, he is. And of course, I've never liked to gave my wife a, a diamond necklace when he didn't give me anything. When I was, <laughs> but he treated her better than he did me. I don't know about that. But, uh, I, I, one thing, look, I never was, was never fired. I, I usually retired before they could fire me, and so, so they never did. They never did get me. I'm sure if I'd stayed there much longer, they'd have figured out a way to get me. And you know, the, the writers love Casey. And really, that was a tough name. That was harder than anything I ever did. Because I love Casey. And the thing that made that tough was Casey talked to me in Pittsburgh. And I'm told it, it's been written, I guess, so I'm not going to say anything out of it. And he told me in Pittsburgh, before we ever lost that last game, he says, you know, there's talk that I may not come back. He said, I'd like to see you manage the ball club. He told me it was on the bench before a ball game. And I, I had opportunities. I knew Kansas City was trying to hire me. I knew that. And, uh, but anyway, we got back to, to, before we left there, after we lost that game, that's when they, they called hit two back in the throat. Uh, Roy Hamey was the general manager. And he come down and he said, Ralph, he said, don't be talking to that Kansas City group. Something's going to happen if we get back to New York. So I talked to Betty, my wife, and uh, he talked to her too and said, you tell Ralph not to do anything. So when I get home, uh, we get back to, to New York. We lived in New Jersey, rented a house in New Jersey. Uh, they, the phone rang and they said, look, we're going to announce tonight that Casey is retiring. Well, don't you come to the dinner or anything, but we don't really need a room or you're going to take his place. But you come to the, to, uh, to Waldorf Astoria tomorrow. Don't let anybody know you're coming. Get a cab down to George Washington Bridge and so they don't know who you are and this and that. So that's what happens. So now Casey goes to the dinner then. It was expected that Casey was going to say he was retired. He got up and said, I've been fired. <laughs> well, that didn't help me, boys. I'll tell you. So now, now I said, I am. And I'll never forget when we had the press conference the next day. Well, actually, the day after that happened. And, you know, there's all the writers. And they had enough mics up there that the place was from everywhere, Casey being fired. And here's this punk kid up there going to be the manager, I guess. It, now, you know, I did my, my records weren't real good as a player, you know. At 500 in World Series, I was one for two, but <laughs> <laughs> I did have a 500 batting average. <laughs> and then they all said, you know, what, how are you going to do this and what are you going to do? And, uh, and it, it was kind of rough. It really was, and, and I wasn't used to that kind of stuff. And, and then, of course, are you going to listen to Casey? Are you going to ask him what? You know, all those kind of questions you get. Well, any of you who know about how many press are here? Raise your hand for most of them. And I knew all the players, and I knew we had a good ball club. And uh, so, you know, I, I thought we should win, and uh, and we did. So that, that, that managing that ball club was not that hard. It, the only thing we had a little trouble with early in the year was the pitching. As far as the other things, we had we had, we had three great catchers in Yogi and Howard and Blanchard to back that up. You would know, it was a real good ball club. We had Scowner at first, but I mean, second, Quebec at third. I mean, it's short, and Boyer at third. And then one smart move I did, I'll take credit for this. I talked to all the catchers. I had Yogi and Howard mainly, with Blanchard's ability. And I said, now I like what I'd like to do is keep both those little bats in the lineup, Elson and Yogi. 
Well, Yogi was a little better outfielder than you think. I mean, uh, he could catch the ball, and Ellie could too. So I would alternate with them and keep them both in the lineup. And that worked. And, and you know, that really helped our ball club that year. So that was one move that worked that did pretty good. But the pitching went bad on me. Turley's arm was bad. And, uh, and you know, we had a bunch of kids pitching. So, and then we made a trade that year that really helped us. We traded uh, Dittmar to get Dittmar. Daly? We got Dittmar to get Daly. And Daly did a great job for us. I mean, a lot of people don't remember that, but, but he did. He, he came in and he, he could relieve in the middle or he could start. And he was a real good pitcher. And that that really helped us. And I remember, uh, what's his name, called us to make that deal. And I was in St. Uh, Cleveland when uh, we made the deal. So that, that deal really did help us a lot. Helped me the most in... in uh, Boston, when I went to Boston, when I came out of retirement, went to Boston. Sully talked me into that, Sullivan. Yaz really helped me. Yaz always wanted to play for me. And he had told me that before. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story about Yaz. I mean, you all know Yaz, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, this, this we don't know him, do we? A lot of times, you know, you're right down on the in, in there now. I'm, I'm, I'm now managing. Yeah, you know, I guess it was still in New York at that time. So anyway, I had a so they sure couldn't get my signs from the bench that I gave to the coaches. My running sign to the third base coach was this. Sending. I couldn't figure this out. I mean, how in the world could they be getting our signs? And they can't be that good because it's several times there was no, not even a running situation, and they'd get it. And I don't know why I happened to do it. But on the one time I went like that, I noticed in left field, see, we're on the visiting dugout, the stream seat went like this to his bill, and they pitched out. I said, it couldn't really be that he's got our signs anyway. So, uh, got a little talk and I talked to the to uh, what's his name third and I said now I'm gonna give you that sign the next time we get a running situation but this is we changed our sign so I gave it this and yes went like that <laughs> they didn't run and I went like this <laughs>
pitcher pitching. And Elliot had already got to the batter circle and was up there. And they had already started to announce his name. And Casey tried to get Howard back into the, the dugout. He didn't want him to hit. It was too late. Well, the first pitch the guy threw, whoever it was, I can't remember now. You'd never believe it. Ellie had a line shot into the left field seats right down the foul line for a home. And that won the ball game. Well, now the writers all came in. Oh, man. What a brilliant move that was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to this conversation I'm right there. I can hear it. And they said, well, Casey, how in the world did you ever, why did you pinch hit Howard in a situation like that in our records? He's not got the one hit 30 some times at back off of that guy. <laughs> You don't realize how many line drives that young man has hit out in that left field. And you know it's true. Writers don't realize. You can, you can just tell them all kinds of stories and they'll believe you. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't know, you know. <laughs> Casey was good on double talk. You never, you never knew what he was going to say. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. I have a question. First, a comment. My son's turning 11. A few days, the same age I was in 61. I brought him for one reason, so that he would know he was a great Yankee manager before Joe Torre. So now he knows that. Well, and I have another. I have a question. How does Pepitone, how was he the manager? Is it Well, <laughs> 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 do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, Joey, though. <laughs> Joe's great now, don't get me wrong. We're in Cleveland.
And, during, and you know, the thing about that home run thing, and this is a new story. You know, Ron, you may have read it. If you haven't, it's very true that, that, that Frontier wasn't interested in 61 home runs at all. In Baltimore, when he hit his 60th, I guess he's 60th off of Stallard, before that game, he had come to me. He had, we'd go places, and the writers were, was following this so close that if Roger didn't have a real good day or didn't hit one in or something, and we win a ball game, a Cubic or a Richards or somebody would drive in the win and run, the writers came into the dugout. They wouldn't even talk to the wrestling room. They wouldn't talk to him. They would all run to Roger. I know. <laughs> he kept going back out, and then he had the home run that night. And, and that's the kind of guy he was. But I would have taken him out if he'd asked him. In fact, that I both know he didn't ask me, so I had to get him in But he, he was not just a good hit, a home run hitter. He was a, a kid said he was a good right fielder with a good arm. And the other thing he would do, he would break up double plays on the bases. I mean, if he hit a ball uh, and, and a guy on first base, he'd go down to second and knock the guy out of there. And, and he could do a lot of things to help him win. Great guy, great ball player. I, you know, if I had a little more, I'd like to talk for another hour. But. Now, can I just follow up? There's just one thing I wanted. Everything you said about Roger was absolutely 